You're welcome. No problem. It's okay. So I've we lost my I lost my liturgist, I lost my nursing home visiting coordinator, and I lost my video guy because the big Lietas have COVID in the house. Jen tested positive, Jillian tested positive. I think they're the only two so far, but we shall see. Our first scripture reading this morning can be found in your pew Bible on page 1050. It comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We will be reading verses 3 through 20. Amen. And the word reads as follows. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? That if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain, and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. Amen. A second scripture reading comes from the book of Romans, chapter 8. We will be reading verses 18 to 28. You can find it on page 1032 of the Pew Bible. That's Romans 8. Oh, there it is. Romans 8, 18 to 28. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. But the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, but not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. Not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit, we groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs that are too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. This is the word of the Lord. I think at some point in life, we all want to get ahead to be in an outstanding position, to be all set. Isn't that why people play the lottery, right? Buy scratch off tickets. You want to get ahead. You want to get a leg up. You want to get an advantage, right? Who wouldn't want to find out that they just inherited a huge sum of money or some nice property? That'd be nice, right? It's like something in the movies, right? The letter arrives and suddenly, oh, I've inherited a mansion. 
how great would it be to discover that something we already own is valuable and can get us a windfall? You know, like people on that show, Antiques Roadshow. And they say, oh, this is actually worth $30,000. What? I got this from my great grandmother. She used to use it to keep the door open. You know, those crazy things, right? It's human nature to want more, to covet those things we don't have. It's why so many people are deeply in debt today. And I'm not even talking about the predatory lending practices of banks and credit cards, although that is a factor. But many people simply live above their means. We want the best. We want top shelf. We want the good stuff, right? We want to be ahead of the game, don't we? Anybody remember the song New York, New York by Frank Sinatra? Yeah? Okay. What does he say in that song? He says he wants to wake up and find I'm king of the hill, top of the heap, top of the list, A number one. His little town blue. Sorry. Okay. But stick to the point. People want to be successful and accomplished, right? Or at the least, they want to look to others as if they are, because the world places importance on that. To strive to be the best, to compete against others, to be a winner. Everybody loves a winner, right? To be ahead of the game. But you know what's really amazing? We, we already are. Yes, indeed. Yeah, so we so are so ahead good. of the game. So the world may not know it, but we ought to. In our reading this morning from 1 Corinthians, Paul said that, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through one man, the resurrection of the death also came through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all are made alive, but each in turn. Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. So what that's telling us is that Jesus was the first one to be resurrected, the first fruits of God's salvation plan. Due to the sin of Adam, one man, we all die in sin, but through the sacrifice of one man, Jesus, we are all made alive. Sin is atoned for. The last verse is particularly important, but each in turn, Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. That's us, those who belong to him. We become the first, top of the list of those saved. In the book of Thessalonians, Paul said some more about this. He said, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of humanity who have no hope. Paul doesn't want us believers to be upset about loved ones, about their deaths, because like the rest of humanity, they have no hope in what comes next. They only have these imagined beliefs. And then he explains why we have hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. So you see, we are ahead of the game, way ahead of the game. We have an earnest hope, and not like the people who don't know Jesus. This is New Testament hope. The word in Greek is elpis. It's like Elvis, but with a P, which carries a meaning of a confident assurance of receiving what is expected or hoped for. So usually when the world says, oh, I hope so, that really means I wish. Oh, I wish. Hell, no, that's going to turn out all right. Oh, I hope so. What does that mean? Oh, I wish it will. What does the world say? Hope for the best, but expect the worst. What do you think you're going to get if you're expecting the worst? That's the wrong philosophy. And that's what we would be doing if we weren't ahead of the game. Sometimes being ahead of the game requires some waiting on our part. That's our favorite thing to do, right? Don't we love that? Right? Don't we love waiting? Don't we love being patient? Don't we just love it? Yeah. The philosophy of the world is just do it. Immediate gratification. ASAP, as soon as possible, right? Yeah, well, God's philosophy is a little different. In Psalm 46, David wrote this. Be still and know. That means recognize and understand that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. 
The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, meaning our high tower, our stronghold. Now take a second and just think about that for a minute. Be still and know that I am God. Be still. In other words, wait. Be patient. Sometimes we have to take stock of things. Sometimes we need to take a step back, take a breath, and remember that we are ahead of the game. And that does mean waiting at times. But waiting where God is involved is different. Waiting on God means a promised and amazing reward. The prophet Isaiah wrote, but those who wait for the Lord shall change and renew their strength and power. They shall lift their wings and mount up close to God like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint or become tired. Those who wait for the Lord. This is what you're promised. You'll mount up with wings like eagles. Eagles are the highest flying birds. They fly miles and miles up. You will run and not be weary. You will walk and not be faint to become tired. That sounds good, right? Some days I'm like, man, Lord, I'm waiting on you. Can I get some of that energy right now? It's about letting go and letting God. Trusting that he already has the plan and he's working it out. Relying on God and not yourself. Those who wait for the Lord, all this is promised to them. Now, this is not promised to those who are waiting for their ship to come in. This is not promised to those who are waiting for the universe to smile on them. This is not promised to the people who send positive vibrations or to those who send thoughts and prayers. No. Those who wait for the Lord, we are ahead of the game. We are so far ahead of the game that the world or the enemy can never catch up unless we slow down and let them. You see, the game is already fixed in our favor. We literally cannot lose. Every gambler looks for that sure thing, right? That one wager that they cannot lose, but they never find it though, because this is what happens. If they do win, they lose that money back trying to make up for past losses. It never equals out. Anybody remember that song by Kenny Rogers, The Gambler? Do you remember how the gambler broke even? He died in his sleep, right? And with what to show for it? The little pearl of wisdom that he told the guy, you gotta know when to fold them, know when to hold them, and know when to walk away, know when to run, right? Wow, that was great, thanks. What did that get him? Absolutely nothing. Because striving for tangible monetary or personal gain never really does. But spiritual gain and wisdom are all that has any true or everlasting value. The only thing. Paul tells us in a reading from Romans just now that Jesus is not the only one who partakes of the first fruits of God. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to being children of God, the redemption of our bodies. We are being delivered. We are ahead of the game. We have the first fruits of God's Holy Spirit. We have both the gifts and the fruit of the Spirit. And as a reminder, the gifts of the Spirit are wisdom, knowledge, faith, gifts of healing, power to do miracles, the ability to prophesy, which, is, which means preaching, uh, spreading God's word, the ability to tell the spirits apart, the ability to speak in different kinds of languages, and the ability to explain what was said in those languages. And the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Being ahead of the game helps us know this. We are assured and know that God being a partner in our labor, all things work together and are fitting into a plan for good to and for those who love God and are called according to his design and purpose. That's us again. We're the called. We're the ones who love God. We have these gifts and we're ahead of the game. But you want to know what's the really coolest thing about these gifts? 
We stay ahead of the game. Why? Well, I'm glad you asked that. Because according to Romans chapter 11, verse 29, for God's gifts and his call can never be withdrawn. That's the NLT. Other versions say they're irrevocable. If you go all the way back to the King James, it says the gifts and calling of God are without repentance, which means he doesn't change his mind. But the message version says it like this, and I love this. God's gifts, bless you, and God's call are under full warranty, never canceled and never rescinded. Full warranty on God's gifts. It's the only thing you're going to get a full warranty on, trust me, because you ain't getting it on your car unless you want to pay a lot of money. Once God has bestowed his call and his gifts upon us, he doesn't take them back. We are, however, responsible for what we do with those gifts and that calling. One day we're going to have to explain to God what we did or didn't do with what he blessed us with. So it is important that we seek God as to what specifically we have been given and how he wants us to use those gifts. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due for us, the things that we've done in the body, whether good or bad. Now, the word in the Greek translated here as judgment seat is bema, B-E-M-A. And it's the word used for the judging stand of the Olympic Games. So what Paul is saying here is that this is a believer's performance review. Will we get the bronze? Will we get the silver? Or will we get the gold medal? Or maybe we'll just get honorable mention. Or maybe we'll miss the podium completely. What need, we need to do good with what we have been blessed with. We are ahead of the game and we need to act like it. You know, God blessed me with the gifts necessary to answer his call and to be a pastor. And I ignored it for a long time. Long time. I went my own way. I may have to answer for that once, once I get to heaven, because God's like, I gave you this gift. What'd you do with it? And I'm going to go like Ralph Cramden, hamana, 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 hamana. For a lot of unfruitful years, I wasted in stubborn rebellion against God. But thanks be to God, I finally straightened up. Thanks be to God, I'm forgiven for my rebellious past, but I only wish that I had listened sooner. Paul sums up chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians with this encouragement. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. I wish I had not wasted so many years doing the exact opposite. Shame on me. But here's the good news. It's never too late to choose to be ahead of the game. You are a Christian, and it gives God such joy when his children turn back to him and desire to have a closer walk with him, to be still and listen, to exercise the gifts that have been given them by setting themselves apart from the world and daring to be all about Jesus. And Jesus is love in this world. I think we can all agree that what the world needs now is love and a lot more of it. People who give generously without regret. People who cheer on others with no envy. People who speak well of others without gossiping. People who give of themselves without growing weary. People who go the extra mile with gladness. People who are unashamed to tell others about their Lord and Savior, who gives them the strength to do all things. They seek no personal glory or gain, but they give all praise to Jesus. They're the ones who are ahead of the game, whom God has made the head and not the tail whom God has seated at heaven's banquet table with Christ. You see, you can proclaim Christ as Savior and still live in rebellion. You may make it into heaven, but what did you gain? Like me, you will have regret for those years you wasted. You, have, you will have deprived yourself of the quality of life you could have lived here on earth. You will have deprived others of the witness you could have been to them of Christ which might have turned their lives around sooner. 
You remember the one thief who was crucified next to Christ? He recognized who Jesus was. And he was promised heaven right there on the spot. With his last breath, he was saved. This is a glorious truth that it is never too late to be saved. As long as you have breath, it's never too late. But all the years that this man had lived as a criminal, hurting others, struggling in ways we can only imagine, he could have counted those to Christ and it would have been a life well lived. Trying to be ahead of the game in our human ways and strength only puts us behind. It maybe even keeps us out of the game completely. Because the true game of life is only played by God's rules. And when you play by him, you are already ahead of the game. The first, the best, with the king of the world on top of the heap, because those in Christ shall be first at heaven's gate. Winners for eternity. So remember this morning, you're ahead of the game. So take that victory lap and then keep on going. Amen? Amen.